Check one, two, 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 one, two, 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 check, check one, two, 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 one, two, check, check one, two, two, check one, two, two, one, two, check, check one, two, 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 check, check. That's good. Anybody else? Sorry. <laughs> check one, two, 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 two. Can you hear okay? Trevor, wait, you're an ABM. Can you guys hear? Check one, two, two, two. All right. Check one, two, check, check, testing one, two, check one, two, check in one, two, test, good, <laughs> check in one, two, check, good. Oh. Check one, two, checking test one, two, testing one, two. <laughs> and I hear it, I'm like, oh, what was that? Checking one, two, check, 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 check. Testing one, checking one. Actually, can I get some more on mine? Checking one, two, checking test one, two, check one, check test one, two. That's good. Okay. Check one, two, two, check one, two, two. Okay. <coughs> Trevor? Check one two check 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 it check 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 a check 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 it check me out check check this out over here what's going on check checky check checky check 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 it check 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 it check it check it check that's hard to do check it 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 check 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 it check 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 it check check it check it check 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 all right, take him down in mind. He's getting carried check. away. Is that okay? Everybody all right? How does that sound? Bring it, bring it down just a hair in mind. Devious shenanigans. Yeah, I'd be, I kind of more of my guitar and my acoustic in here. Uh, it's a little more. That's good. All right, let's do. Uh, Everybody's good. Let's do here and now.
Check. 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 Check, check. Check, check. One, one. Now you can hear. Check. One, two, three. Is that good? Okay. Hey, William, let's go ahead and roll with the uh, white flag.
Jesus, your name is power.
Check one, two, check one, two, testing one, two. Sibilance, sibilance, cowbell, cowbell. All right, good. All right.
you're down and you're out and you don't think you have a friend when you're lost in the dark and you can't see what's around the bend just hold on You know that I know life can be so hard it makes you want to give up. But don't you know over the horizon the sunny day you're looking for is waiting right here in my love. So just hold My name is Stephen Defer. I'm the senior pastor here at Cokesbury Church, and I just want to take a second to welcome you guys. Um, it's already been a full day with our pre-conference work, and then tonight uh, to be able to welcome you all. Um, I have the basic belief that the church is the hope of the world, and that no matter where you look in our society, there is nothing that has the power at its fingertips like the church, um, because it's only the church that has the power to redirect a human destiny and change a human heart. And I still believe that a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is the answer the world's looking for. And so what we're going to be talking about tonight and tomorrow, I hope will breathe life into you. Uh, I hope that it will inspire you, and I hope it will challenge a bunch of us uh, to continue to figure out how we're going to change the world through the power of Jesus Christ. And so again... Just want to say welcome. Uh, while you're here, please consider Cokesbury your church uh, home. Um, feel free if you have questions. A lot of our staff are hanging around the room. Uh, and I'm going to ask Rebecca Fetzer, who's also on our staff, if she'll come up now. Greetings. 
It's been a good day so far here, and I uh, hope you guys have felt welcome and at home. want to continue for you to feel that way. Um, if you need a restroom, there are some out this door here. There are some out in the front lobby. And if you have any questions about anything, just let one of us know. Also, um, Lifted, our band from Ultawa, is here tonight, and they have a merchandise table right outside the door. They're raising money for their Czech Republic mission. Is that correct? And so they would love for you to support them with buying CDs and T-shirts and all that kind of good stuff. Also, the Cokesbury table is down the hall. You saw Carlesia out there, I'm sure. And she'll be um, selling books, and George's book is available out there. So you guys, again, just make yourselves at home and have a good evening. Hi. Hey, I'm Will Lauterbach, and... I serve on the witness team for the conference, as, as does Rebecca, and, uh, and Rebecca, we thank you for your leadership on the team and, and for being a connection here to the church. Stephen, thank you for your hospitality, for having us. Welcome to Holston's Evangelism Conference for 2014. This is an event that's been two years in the making, and, and Ronnie will give you a little more about that later. A few um, items of business. The first thing is that there weren't, there's not going to be a dismissal with with any kind of instructions tonight when we're done, uh, you're, you're going to end in a powerful way, and it's going to be a time of prayer and a time of worship, and, and I give thanks for that. So you're going to be back here between 9 and 9.30 in the morning, right? And you're going to have a wonderful day uh, that we'll dismiss sometime after 3, and, and we're going to be challenged, and we're going to grow together, right? All right, so what time are you coming in the morning? What are you going to bring with you in the morning? A smile? Joe's going to bring his name tag. I found it for you earlier. You're welcome. This is your meal ticket tomorrow. Do not forget your name tag. Bring that with you, and, and we'll enjoy a time of a fellowship around the table. I, I want to say welcome to our band. They've been standing up here for like 10 minutes, and we apologize uh, for that. Uh, but as, as we prepare for worship, I would invite you to, to stand, to offer your name to someone around you, to welcome them and to prepare your hearts as the band leads us in worship. Let your mercy rise, let your hope resound, let your love your grace run free let your name bring peace heaven come in the here and now this song is a prayer for the church we want to be a part of if you'll join and sing and pray with us tonight God let your kingdom come let's sing together shelter where the broken find their place. Want to be a refuge? We want to be a refuge for the weak. We want to be a light for the world to see. We want to be a love that breaks the walls and fills the streets. Let's go. 
joy and it will be my joy to say your will your way and it will be my joy to say your will your way and it will be my joy to say your will your way always Let's sing it together lift it up Your will, your way, and it will be my joy to say. 
y'all doing tonight? Who's had a great day? Who's been here for the uh, pre-conference stuff? Has it been good? Is that a dumb question? Yeah, of course it's been good, right? We're going to keep singing just a couple more songs, if you will. These next couple are just songs of surrender, songs of just acknowledging God's power over us. And all we can do is just surrender to and serve God. I think God's got some powerful stuff for us this weekend, some powerful, maybe some hard stuff to surrender to. But he's still calling us to do that. If you'll sing with us tonight. out we lift the cross we lift the cross lift it high lift it high we lift the cross lift it high lift it high we lift the cross lift it high lift it high we lift the cross lift it high
Join us in a familiar hymn tonight. I sing all to thee, Jesus. I surrender all to him. I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence. Sing, I surrender. do this one time with just the voices singing out. We've become this one big choir tonight as we've sung together. Will you sing this? Will you join with me? Lift your hands if you're comfortable. Close your eyes. Worship with me. With us, excuse me. Tonight, sing I surrender. We sing I surrender all and I surrender God, we lift our voices high to you tonight. We surrender to your will, your way, always. God, have your way in us tonight, this weekend. God, teach us about you. Teach us about your people. Teach us about this world. God, we sing and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated tonight. He's going to fall down, Rusty said. Uh, thank Lifted for coming tonight. Would you please? Now I want you to do something more important. I want you to thank Jesus for your salvation tonight. Bishop Taylor, uh, as you know, Jesus took 12 and turned the world upside down. Look around you tonight. 
Folks, we can change the world. Amen? Amen. And it needs to be changed. I'm, I'm so excited. You can go ahead and have a seat. I'm so excited about what God's doing here. Uh, we started two years ago planning this event with George. Uh, I called him on the phone and asked him would he come, and he said yes, but I can't come for two years. I said, we'll wait. Amen? Uh, if you've uh, read his book, Vital, uh, I read a lot of books every year, and um, it was so good. I told him last night when I picked him up at the airport, I've read it twice. And he said, you may be the first person who's ever read it twice. Uh, probably not. There's probably others. If you haven't read the book, you can pick it up at Cokesbury's table out here. It's just an awesome, uh, outstanding book. I've learned uh, since George has been here today that he cares more about people than he cares about buildings. Can I get an amen? Uh, folks, that's what it's all about. Uh, it, it, when it's all said and done, it's all about the people that we've touched in this life and won to Jesus Christ. That's my heart and soul. And that's George Acevedo's heart and soul as well. I'm so excited that he's here. Uh, he pastors Grace Church in uh, Florida. He'll tell you more about that when he comes tonight. He's got... Uh, Three people with him, and he'll tell you more about them as well. They've done such an awesome job speaking to us. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for the work that you're doing, and thank you for your hunger to see people come to Jesus Christ. Uh, George is going to come in just a moment, but before that, watch this video. It's my medicine. It's God. It's the gracious hand of God over this building. It may look like a Sunday morning but this is a typical Friday night at Florida's Grace United Methodist Church. I've been here for 10 years. I haven't left. It's my juice, and it's every Friday night. Don't miss it. Grace is a multicultural, multi-site worship community made up of four congregations in the Fort Myers area. We have an open invitation for people to come and be healed. God's called us to help the invisible people of our community and of our world. But it really is the fuel behind everything else. The Reverend George Acevedo has seen Grace's weekend attendance go from 400 to 2,600 since he became lead pastor in 1996. Acevedo credits a prayer that has become the foundation for the church's mission statement. One of my mentors taught me a prayer, and I learned it, Lord, send us people nobody else wants. And that was a part of the prayer that we prayed at that church. When I came here... It just was a part of who I was. It had become a part of my personal, spiritual leadership DNA. But Jesus was born on the other side of this. This Jesus, he was a homeless, itinerating preacher who had around him a group of ragamuffins. Remember? Many who call Grace their church home are battling addictions, like David Sampson. When I came here, I was homeless, helpless, you know, and just no direction. And uh, Pastor Eileen, she preached a message from the book of Matthew uh, 633, which talked about do not worry. And at that time, I had been sleeping outside. I had been trying to find direction. The presence of God in this place is so powerful. It moves me to have to move. Grace's vision statement is to partner with God in transforming people from unbelievers to fully devoted disciples of Jesus. For many, this starts with 12-step programs which the church offers seven days a week, along with support programs for families. Well, I actually started coming over to this campus for the food for the week, and I struggled with drug addiction, you know, I was in and out, couldn't get clean and sober. What God, you know, did for me, he used these people, and they just started loving me, and they were just there, and they never stopped, and no matter how much of a mess I was, I would come in here, and they just continued to love me. And over the past 18 months, I'm sober now. My life has completely turned around. <laughs> As in other vital congregations, those who've been helped at Grace are eager to lead others. 17 years old, I was a blackout drinker. Jim Noson lived with addiction for 24 years until joining Grace more than a decade ago. For the past seven years now, my wife and I have led marriage ministry. So here I am, a person that has taken the covenant of marriage and destroyed it. And now we're helping other people making our mess his message, meaning God. The Reverend Arlene Jackson found her place at Grace, serving the Fort Myers Central Campus. Daily Bible readings and devotions. I was called to be a pastor many, many years ago, but uh, because I'm in recovery from alcoholism, I, I was pretty much sure they didn't ordain people like me. <laughs> and uh, I spent a lot of years running away from my calling. Being here at Grace Church and being involved in 
a church that really uh, does minister to the people that nobody else wants and the people nobody else sees, the last, the lost, the least. Um, it made me see that maybe God might have gotten it right and, and maybe he did call me. Everybody is called to do something in the church, even, it, it, what the, even if it's opening a door or giving somebody a glass of water. So I see the word in action. People got to go to a greater level than just going to church. There's a lot of conversation in the church about what it means to be a come-to church and what it means to be a go-to church. Come-to churches are the kind of churches that just kind of open the doors on Sunday or Wednesday and say, come to us. Go-to churches are the kind of churches that throw open their doors and send their people out throughout the week to go to the community. Uh, God's already at work in this world. He's just looking for some folk who are willing to partner with him. This video was brought to you by the people of the United Methodist Church through world service donations. Those are our fortunate dollars at work. <laughs> so. Hey, uh, good evening. It's good to be here with you from Florida, suffering for Jesus down there as we are. And somebody's got to do it. Might as well be us, right? Amen. It is good to be with you. I told the folks here earlier today that uh, it is colder here than our freezer back home, so I don't know. Uh, our team is here with us, and, and uh, when I was talking with, with Ronnie and later with Will about coming, I said, you know, if we're going to talk about doing ministry as a team, I need to bring my team. And so I'm grateful um, that the, the, the committee uh, made a way for that to happen. And so I'm going to ask uh, if you guys, uh, should I have them come up here, tech guys? I guess so. You guys, uh, you guys just come and step up here just so you can know who they are. Um, they're, they're the other three uh, uh, pastors, we, there are five of us, um, uh, five appointed pastors uh, at, the, at the church, but uh, I want you to meet who they are. This is Pastor Arlene uh, Jackson. She pastors our downtown urban campus. <laughs> Pastor Sherry Lacey, she pastors our out east campus in Fort Myers Shores. And then Pastor Wes, who pastors the original campus, the Cape Coral and the Grace Community campuses uh, at, at, in, uh, in Cape Coral. And I don't do anything. I just kind of let them do all the work. So, okay, y'all can go back and sit down now. That's all right. <laughs> Listen, um, you know, when somebody gives you um, a, a little prelude to their keynotes, you might uh, hold a little suspect, you might hold them in suspect. But I, but I want to take and do a little prelude before, uh, before I actually... Uh, jump into um, my message uh, of encouragement for tonight. Um, I want you to throw up that, that pyramid that, that, that I gave you, that little triangle piece. If you could put that up on the screen, the first slide, if you would. Um, often what people will say to me when they, uh, when they come to our church is they talk about the results that we're getting. Um, they're talking about what we get for doing what we do. And um, the, the, here's the truth. Let's just be frank. Um, I go to seminars, I watch podcasts and, and video casts, and, and, I, and I attend workshops and seminars, and then I bring home the notebook that, that showed me the results that they got from doing certain kinds of things in the life of their church. But the truth is that my church and my location, and frankly, my capacities are different. Uh, because just beneath results, is, if you go to the next slide, is the processes, how we do it to get what we get. Now, I don't know about you, but I can buy the same box series, and I can do it the same way that the box tells me to do it, and so can you, and we'll get different results, because we're in different contexts, and we're different kinds of people. But if you go beneath uh, the results and beneath the processes are what we like to call the principles, why we do what we do. Now, these things are profoundly spiritual they're profoundly philosophical at their core. They're bedrock reasons why we do what we do. And here's what uh, my hope is for the three keynote addresses. My hope is that for the three keynote addresses, we will do our work and we will mine down and drill down to the principal level so that every pastor and leader who comes to the Holston Evangelism Conference will be able to go home and say, I just didn't get some processes that help me get some results, but now I understand some principles that I'm going to figure out how to use them in my context so that I can get the results appropriate 
to where I am and to who I am. One of my heroes in the faith is E. Stanley Jones. And Dr. Jones said this. He says, we don't break the Ten Commandments. We break ourselves upon them. There are certain principles in life that you don't break, but they break you. And I believe that Jesus taught us principles that will help our local churches be the vital congregations that God wants them to be, unique to who you are, unique to your context. But we have to discover what they are. And here's the truth. We either learn these principles and follow them, or we will be broken upon them. 85% of the churches in North America are plateaued or declining. What's happening? We are trying to break these principles that Jesus gave us, that he said, if we will do these things, your local fellowship will prevail. And so my hope and my prayer is that we'll drill down, that we'll mine down to these transferable, timeless principles that will work in any setting. Now, let me also give this prelude. I want to share with you 10 truths about our church, which are kind of a fancy way of saying, don't believe the video you just watched, all right? And here's the deal. I want to share with you 10 truths about our church that I think will help you. Because when I go to a conference, here's what I always notice. They always trot out their very best. And then, and then I go home feeling like, dang it, I can't do that. So let me just share with you um, uh, 10 truths about our church, all right? You ready for this? Come on now. If I wanted to silence, I'd gone to an Episcopalian conference. So you, We were shouting Methodists at one time. Are you ready for this? All right, all right. Number one. Number one, ministry is very messy. Somebody just got saved. That's right. Ministry is very messy. I don't know how ministry is for you. If it's nice and neat, I don't think you're doing New Testament kingdom ministry. Um, just this past week, we ran into a fiasco. We have a pets ministry that has about 200 pets in it that go to nursing homes, that go to homes for unwed mothers, and it's kind of a pet therapy thing, and they go through this temperament and all the rest. If you want to get a good laugh, ask Pastor West to tell you about the skunk that he had to have the head cut off of because it scratched a little kid and it had... They thought it might have rabies. It's a, it really is a terrible story. But it's just terrible. Poor little skunk. I pray it knew Jesus. Um, the skunk's owner told Pastor Wes that the, the skunk's like cousin, the other skunk that she had, is now an atheist because Wes had the skunk killed. Um, but, uh, but some of our pets folk got mad because um, we had to tell the pet folks they couldn't bring their pets to church. And I know it sounds weird, but we have all these people that want to bring their dogs to church. And, um, and so we had to tell them they couldn't do that. And, it, and it's caused an uproar. I mean, Facebook, social media, they're tweeting. They're talking very bad about Pastor West. Very, very bad things they're saying about him. But ministry is very, very messy. Um, there was a couple who uh, has attended all four sites of Grace Church. And one of the things we've discovered is that people will try to triangulate us against each other. And so this couple that we had reasons, now please hear me, we're a very gracious congregation, but we had reasons not to want to marry them right away. We thought they had some issues they needed to work on. And, and so we, they came to each one of us, all five of the pastors, and asked us to marry them. And we each gave them the same answer. And we said, look, you got some work you need to do before we're willing to do your wedding. And again, there's lots of reasons I won't get into tonight for saying that. But, but, but it gets really messy. And sometimes I say yes and Pastor West says no. And so we get at odds with one another. But if you're going to do kingdom ministry, it's going to be messy. Number two, ministry is really, really hard. I don't know about you, but lost people in, in our universe are very, very difficult at times. Um, when you start saying, Lord, bring us the people nobody else wants, nobody else sees, and God does, here's the truth. As I told the group earlier today, unchurched people are not church broke. They don't know our secret handshakes. They don't have the decoder rings. They don't take their demon-possessed children out of church when they start screaming. They bring their coffee into the sanctuary and they pour it on our sacred carpet, Right? Because everybody knows that the sanctuary is a sacred place that you're never supposed to bring co uh, coffee into, right? That's in the Bible somewhere, right? Yeah. And this, this is Ronnie's deal that he's saying is, you know, we believe that people are more precious than carpet. And, and we believe that lost people really matter. 
And so we want to be the kind of church that says um, that if you're lost and you're very far from God, we were expecting you to come, and we know that you don't know all the rules. And to, and to do this kind of ministry, it's very, very hard. And I don't know about you, lost people are hard, but I can tell you who are the hardest people to deal with. It's church people. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. It's folks that are overly saved that bother me, right? And then the complexity uh, of ministry. I mean, we have uh, four sites. We have three campus pastors, and it gets very complex at times, and that can make ministry real hard. And then I don't know about you, but my own woundedness and my own brokenness makes ministry hard. Number three, there are lots of gaps in our ministry. So don't believe, again, what, what you may have read, even in the book that I wrote, there are lots of gaps in our ministry. If you can figure this one out, please come and teach us. We have discovered that it's not winning people to Jesus that's hard. See, evangel I mean, the gospel sells itself if we're presenting it right. I thought somebody would say amen to that. The gospel sells itself. What, what, what's hard for me is, is, is not evangelism, it's discipleship. And we, we can win people to Jesus like there's no tomorrow. We're struggling with trying to figure out how to, how to get them in connected to the body of Christ. And in our fellowship, that's what we're struggling with. Or as Billy Graham said, it ain't catching them that's hard, it's cleaning them. So uh, we've got lots of gaps. Number four, we do a few things real well, a few things, a few more things good, several things average, and a few things we do very badly. And it depends on what side of Grace Church you come to. At our, at our uh, Shores campus, one of our, our smallest of our campuses, um, we have the best youth ministry going on at our smallest campus. We do okay at our large campus with big facilities and a wonderful youth pastor. We just haven't found the key to unlock the door to like explosive youth ministry. Uh, but some of our campuses um, do worship really well and others of them do recovery really well. But we do a few things well uh, and a lot of things we do kind of average. Uh, number five, we want you to know that we've had some epic fails in our time together. I've been there 18 years at Grace Church. And I don't have time to share with you all the things that we've done. I can tell you that we, we adopted our first campus. We did not know what we were doing. And eight years later, Pastor Sherry is picking up the pieces from not knowing what we were doing. We tried to do this justice ministry in partnership with a whole bunch of churches in our community, and it just failed miserably. We started a second contemporary worship service at our downtown campus, and we could never get it to grow until we finally had to say uncle and shut it down. We've had some epic fails, and those are just a few. Number six, we want you to know that we never have enough volunteers. We never have enough volunteers. We'll, we'll enjoy, like, we'll get, like, to one week where we feel like, man, we got every slot filled. And then it's like the Lord says, ah, and boom, then we don't have enough volunteers. Number seven, we are very resource challenged. Um, our, our church uh, is filled with lots of people in recovery. And when you invite the people that nobody else wants and nobody else sees, they don't have a whole lot of money. And I don't know if you've checked it out, but a tithe on zero is still zero. And, um, and so we're always resource challenged. And we do all four sites of Grace Church for less than two and a half million dollars. And number eight, that in spite of all of this, God is, in the tran is transforming individuals, marriages, families, businesses, and our community. Uh, next Saturday, not tomorrow, but next Saturday, I'll be marrying Patty and her fiance, Mike. And five years ago, um, Patty was walking the street selling her body to, sell, to buy crack. And a few, uh, few days from now, she'll walk down the center aisle of the Cape Coral campus wearing a beautiful white, white dress, cleansed by the blood of Jesus, forgiven and restored. <laughs> or I could tell you about Christy, who I saw last Sunday as I preached, I was privileged to preach at our downtown urban campus, who used to sleep on the steps of the old Central United Methodist Church when she was a drug addict and a prostitute. She eventually found Jesus at the new Grace Central campus. She got sober. She stopped going to jail. She got a job, and she joined our church. She volunteers now at the thrift store every week. She found Denny there, and they got married and a couple of years ago, and just the other day, they drove up and showed Pastor Arlene their brand-new Kia. Now, when you go from sleeping on the streets and selling your body to owning a brand new Kia and having a full-time job and volunteering at the life of your church, you say, go God, it's worth it all. Um, number nine, number nine, I just want you to know that in spite of everything I've said, it's, it really is worth it. The work we do in the local church is really worth it. There's nothing better than getting a front row seat at Life Change. 
just a few uh, weeks ago, Pastor Wes went down to our Grace Community Center to meet with uh, one of our newest ministries, the Exceptional Entrepreneurs Ministry. This is a worm farming ministry that we've started for special needs young adults. We got a grant from our local foundation and we're able to hire special needs young adults to work for us at Grace Church at our community center in this worm farming ministry. They sell worms to fishermen and they sell worm castings as fertilizer and worm tea. I never knew about worm tea as a pesticide. Uh, one of the young adults, the unemployment rate among young adults is uh, special needs kids is 98%. And one of the young adults, Tito, got his first check. Pastor Wes and I wrestled with who got to go t give Tito his first check. And Wes won. Well, he came by the church the other day with his mother, asked for Pastor Wes. And Pastor Wes went up to see Tito, this young adult special needs employee of Grace United Methodist Church of Cape Coral, Inc., and he said, Pastor Wes, I want to show you something. And he held up his britches and he showed him a brand new pair of work boots. And he told Pastor Wes, he said, this is the first pair of shoes I've ever bought for myself. Doesn't get any better than that. And let me just say, lastly, solo de gloria, glory to God alone. Now, we've been behind the curtain at our church where the wizard lives. And it's not that spectacular. This thing, whole thing is nothing but a miracle every single day. Uh, the church that I'm privileged to serve with this amazing team that's here with you this weekend, we can tell you um, we're not doing anything that special. But we want to share with you in these days what we believe are some of these uh, transferable, timeless principles that can help your church and help our church get on with this business of making the realities of heaven the realities of earth. But one last thing before we jump into the message itself. I'm almost there. I want to tell you about something that happened to me this past December. In our church, we do this soap journaling, this scripture observation application prayer journaling, where you read through the New Testament twice and the Old Testament once. And we've tried to make it a congregation-wide uh, daily Bible engagement exercise. And the thing about the end of the year in December is you always end the year reading the book of Revelation. Now, when I used to be a drug addict and alcoholic, I understood the book of Revelation really well. But after I got sober and became a, a pastor and started to study the book of Revelation, I don't know about you, but I haven't gotten that thing figured out. So I was reading Revelation 19 somewhere near the end of December. And you remember that John the Apostle was a seasoned, aging follower of Jesus who had been exiled to the island of Patmos when he had his vision that he records in the book of Revelation. By this time, we believe he had likely already penned his gospel, the gospel of John, and the three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 5th John. Y'all awake? 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. All right. In the New Testament. Uh, we, we, we do know that he had probably already seen or heard of the death of the other disciples and countless other followers of Jesus. All this is to say that John was no rookie follower of Jesus by this time. He was an old man who was a seasoned, mature follower of Jesus. And in Revelation 19, I read how about in the first 19 verses, how John has this audio-visual experience of worship and praise in front of a vast crowd, including these 24 elders and this thing that John calls the four living beings. And then an angel appears to John and says these words, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. These are true words that come from God. And then verse 10, Revelation 19, 10. And then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said, no, don't worship me. I'm a servant of God, just like you and your brothers and sisters who testify about their faith in Jesus. Worship only God. For the essence of the prophecy is to give a clear witness for Jesus. Worship only God. Now, now, John was in the spirit on the Lord's day, John wrote, when John sees and hears an angel announcing the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he is so moved by this that he falls to his knees to worship the angelic being. Now, remember, John is a mature believer. He's, he's a good Jew, and he knew that idolatry was at the core of our struggle to, with sin. And yet, this mature, seasoned follower of Jesus fell into what I want to call tonight the easy trap of idolatry. 
You see, it could be that it's easier, the easiest trap for idolatry for maturing believers are the ones that are spiritual and religious in nature. You see, the temptation to worship a tree or a rock is fairly easy for any of us to avoid. I get that. It's the temptation to worship, now stay with me on this church, the newest or the coolest pastor, the hippest church, the best worship band. That's the stuff that gets closer to home for me. The temptation to bow the knees in the presence of Bill Hybels or Adam Hamilton, Elevation Church or Saddleback or Hillsong United or Matt Redman is truly more of a trap for me, and I would guess for you too. You see, maturing Christian leaders can get caught in the easy trap of idolatry. John did. And John's succumbing to this helps me, though it does not in any way excuse it. See, it helps me to know that one who walked and talked with Jesus physically was lured into the trap of idolatry. This gives me comfort, but it also gives me some caution. So here's my deal with you, and I hope you'll shake on it with me. Let's worship only God in these two days. Don't worship me or our team or this band or or this church or anything else. Let's worship only God. And if we'll focus our attention on God when we leave here tomorrow afternoon, and we'll go home and we'll say, we have been with Jesus on the mountaintop. Deal? Deal? All right. Here's the first principle I want to talk about for my next few minutes. I want to talk about this principle that faithfulness precedes fruitfulness. Say that with me. Faithfulness precedes fruitfulness. Now, you say, wait a second, George, I I came all this way, and I thought I was here to hear an evangelism conference. I, I thought we were here to talk about how our church can be vital and fruitful. I came here to learn about how to reach people who are far from God, and I want you to stay with me on this one. This is a principle, a timeless, transferable principle. Could it be that our lack of fruitfulness back home is the direct result of our lack of faithfulness. Put another way, could it be that what I learned in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous is true? That you cannot give what you do not have. So we're going to, before we go on tomorrow, to talk about some transferable principles around how to be more fruitful, we want to talk about being faithful tonight. And, and to do that, tell them I said hello. To do that, I want us to go to Red Letter Words of Jesus. Now, in these days at our church, um, we're in a series called One, and, and we're, we're, we're trying to talk about the oneness that we have, that we're on one mission of one spirit speaking with one voice. And we're looking at the upper room discourse of Jesus. You know it from John 13 to John 17, the largest section of scripture of red letter words of Jesus. Jesus gathers with his disciples in the upper room and he begins by washing their feet to show them the full extent of his love. And then Jesus teaches. It's almost completely red letter in your Bible. Jesus teaches them. And I I was always taught, if you want to know what somebody thinks is important, listen to the last things they said. And these are some of Jesus' swan song words. And listen to what Jesus said from John 15, verses 1 through 8. I'll read them for you. Jesus said, I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce what? Much fruit. A little bit of fruit? Much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Let that sink in. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You mean, mean, I can't get a little bit of fruit without you? Jesus said. Now anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Come on, Jesus, where's your grace? Such branches are gathered into a pile and 
to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Now read this last line with me. Ready? Go. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciple. This brings great glory to my Father. Now there's a lot here. And I promise you I'm not going to do a deep dive exegesis on these texts. But I want to share with you what I believe are three timeless transferable principles that come out of this text that I think will help us in understanding that faithfulness precedes fruitfulness. Here's the first thing. Faithfulness takes a team. Faithfulness takes a team. One of the sad realities about reading the New Testament particularly is that it was written in Greek and we read it in English. And when we read words that are translated from Greek to English, it doesn't, there isn't always an exact equivalent. Another thing is that our language is limited in many ways. And so when we read the word you in this verse, we tend to take it personal, meaning that Jesus is speaking to me. But here's the truth. When you read these texts in the Greek, every time the word you is used in this text, it's not in the singular, but it's in the plural. Or as you all would say down here in Tennessee, usins or y'all or you know, uans or whatever. You got it. I getting it right? Ewans. I'm Puerto Rican. Come on now. Give a brother some, some slack. Ewans. And so Jesus, Jesus is talking here, and he's not simply talking to George. He's talking to all of God's people. Jesus is gathered in the upper room, and when he says this to his disciples, he's saying, you have already been pruned. I remain in me, and I will remain in all of you. You see, Jesus is reminding us that if we are going to be faithful or fruitful for him, we have to do this thing in community. You know, um, I have figured this out a little bit later in my ministry. I shared with the group earlier this morning that I was raised and my models were all heroic solo leaders. But over the last eight years, I've had a conversion of sorts. It's one of the reasons why, frankly, I've been trying in this last third of my ministry to work myself out of a job. Because I believe that it, the best part of my life needs to be spent living in community richly and deeply with a handful of people if God will allow us for the rest of our lives together. And so I've welcomed community so that I could become more faithful and thereby more fruitful. I told the folks earlier today, and since most of y'all weren't here, I'm going to tell you again that every week or every other week I meet with a coach. And my coach is a Christian layman, never been to seminary, barely graduated from college. But he's one of the best Christians I know. And Craig Robertson and I meet every other week. And it doesn't matter whether he's in Switzerland, whether he's back home in Lexington, Kentucky, or whether he was as he was this past Thursday in my living room enjoying a cup of coffee. And Craig asks me tough questions. Craig asks me how my marriage is doing. He asks me if I'm spending time with Jesus. And if I'm not spending time with Jesus, he asks me what I'm going to do so that I can spend more time with Jesus. We shook hands this week, and I told him that I would get up earlier one day a week where I was kind of missing in my daily devotions. He said, good, I'll check on you. You see, we have to invite and welcome that kind of accountability if we're going to be faithful and thereby be fruitful. I have a team. I introduced you to them. And this team is really a team. We're not a group. We're a team. We would take bullets for each other. I'd at least take one in the shoulder for most of them. Probably not in the torso, but at least in the shoulder. Now, we really are a team. And my team meets together no less than 30 to 40 hours a month. We spend lots of time together. We play together. We pray together. We work hard together. We have to be in teams. I've been in a covenant group with a group of six pastors for 22 and a half years. When we started this in early in our ministries, we were the guys that sat in the back of annual conference, afraid of all the old guys that were up front. Now, 22 and a half years later, we're the old guys up front. <laughs> but here's the deal. Matthew and Dale and Max and Doug and Wayne, these guys are my best friends in the world. I get a text from them every day, a phone call from them every single day. Um, just this morning, Matthew texted me to say, I want you to know I'm praying for you, that God will use you. It's amazing. 
when I'm traveling away at hotels and speaking at conferences, they'll call me and say, what are you watching on TV? Are you keeping your eyes and your heart pure? That's what being in a covenant group means. And I can't be fruitful in my ministry if I didn't have these guys to help me stay faithful to Jesus. My youngest son has struggled with an addiction to oxycodone and to heroin. He's been homeless. He's been in rehab. He's been in jail. It's been the most difficult journey I've ever had to go through. I'd give up all the ministerial success if my precious baby boy would just love Jesus and be sober. And um, it's been tough because it's been happening in my private world while in my public ministry world. I've been getting awards. I was named the Distinguished Evangelist of our denomination and writing books and asked to speak at annual conferences and conferences like this. And so when I'm standing on the platform and I'm sharing things that are going on in our ministry, what's going on behind the scenes in my personal life has been hellish. But can I tell you um, that there's authenticity in what I've done, I believe, because of a team of men and women who have walked with me and with my wife, Cheryl. As I've spent the last several years in a step study with a group of men walking through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous so that I can keep my heart clean and my life pure. It takes a team to be faithful to Jesus so that you can be fruitful for him. I want you to know that I have on speed dial my counselor. This is what it takes for me to be faithful. I'm that sick. I'm that messed up. I have to have a counselor. I just came out of a three or four month season of seeing her every other week. It's part of the way I have to live my life so that I can stay connected to Jesus. My team honored me this past year by saying after uh, 28 years in ministry and 17 complete years at the church that I'm serving, they honored me by giving me and allowing me to take four months off where I was able to travel out uh, in Europe with my wife and, and get some time of wholeness that I'll tell you about. And I share all these things with you uh, so that you would understand this is what this one guy has to do to live in community, to remain in Jesus. Now, I don't, I don't know what it takes for you. I don't think you should follow my pattern, and I'm probably not going to follow yours. But here's what I promise you. If you are not living richly and deeply in community, you will not be faithful, and therefore you will not be fruitful. Because Jesus said, I'm not saying it, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Here's the second principle. That faithfulness is cultivated by learning to abide in Christ. Faithfulness is cultivated by learning to abide in Christ. Um, Jesus said it. He said, remain in me and... I will remain in you. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. Um, how many of y'all love NASCAR? Yoo-hoo. I figured getting more of y'all would love NASCAR, I guess. Man, I'm not in Tennessee, I don't guess. Maybe I'm in Virginia. But, uh, it, you know, Las Vegas is a gambling town, and last Sunday, did, I don't know how many of y'all watched the race. Um, I hate NASCAR. I think it's of the devil. But... Um, <laughs> Half the people in my church do, and they love country and western music and NASCAR. And so, uh, but I read about this in the newspaper, that Dale Earnhardt Jr. gambled and he lost last weekend. Uh, Brad Kozlowski won the Cobalt 400 at the Las Vegas Motorsport Speedway. When Dale Earnhardt Jr. ran out of gas, I watched the video of it, he calculated that he had enough gas, so he thought, to finish the race. And Earnhardt bet that his car would have enough fuel to finish but sadly, he didn't, and he finished second. Now, let's check this out. If you saw the video, you, you, can, you can YouTube it later. He was half a lap from winning when he ran out of gas. Now, I don't know about you, but Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s experience last Sunday often illustrates my life. Just when I think, just when I think I've got life won, I run out of gas. And, you know, my wife and I date every Friday night. That's been a part of my recovery. My wife and I date every Friday night. And we enjoy a nice dinner date out, and uh, the older we get, the earlier we leave. 
And so we're hanging out with, with Bishop Dindy and all the, all the old folks, at, at, you know, catching the, catching the four o'clock dinner, you know. And because uh, we got to get back to the nursing home, I guess. I don't know. But uh, now, you know, it's true. Come on now, sister. You know, it's true. And so Cheryl and I will do that. And we'll grab a movie and things are going good. And Papa's hoping for a little romance when he gets home, you know. Come on, church. You know, we can, if we can't talk about love and win in church, where can we talk about it? And so, so I'm figuring things are going to go good. And we're on our way out to the car to make our way home. And she'll say something to me that will trip a trigger inside of me, and the devil will come out of Pastor George's mouth. And I will say something that as it's coming out of my mouth, I'm going, no. <laughs> and I've run out of gas. Am I alone? Oh, come on, you bunch of liars. We got a group for you. Am I alone? No, no. Or I'm sitting in a church meeting with my colleagues over here to my right, and we're having one of those wonderful noisy meetings that we have all the time. And, and, and we're talking about some aspect of ministry. And it's normally Pastor Sherry who says something that trips an insecurity button inside of me. And I run out of self-control. And I start to say things to my precious colleagues that I shouldn't be saying. I run out of gas. Now, I'm not alone in this experience. We all agree. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that, as Dallas Willard says in his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, many, too many of us are trying to be Christian, and not enough of us are training to be Christian. Too many of us are trying to be Christian, not enough of us are training to be Christian. Or, to put it in the words of Jesus, we're not remaining in Him. In many of the early church fathers and mothers who wrote about these texts of Jesus said that the unspoken third person of the Trinity is the sap that runs from the vine to the branches. And we need to stay connected to the Holy Spirit if we're going to experience supernatural peace, supernatural self-control in our lives. Do you remember the words of Jesus? Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you? Oh, we love that part of the verse, don't we? Here's the rest of it. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. And here's what Dallas Willard says. He says that we don't follow Jesus and get rid of our yoke. We follow Jesus and exchange our heavy yoke for his easy yoke. Ever seen a yoke? It's still a yoke. It still weighs something. And, and part of our struggle is that we want a simple, easy Christianity. But we're still going to have to train with the easy yoke of Jesus to be followers, to abide in him. In the studies that have been done about pastors, about 75% of pastors do not have daily devotions. And the only time they interact with scripture is when they're preparing sermons or Bible studies. Now, friends, I don't know how we can stay connected to the vine with the sap of the Spirit, producing supernatural patience, self-control, and love in our life if we're not taking time every day to listen to God. Um, I do daily devotions every day, not simply because I have to or it's a part of my job, but it's life or death for me. It is my way to stay connected it primarily helps me to learn to listen to God. It dethrones self when I take the time to spend time with Jesus. But it, secondarily, it also offers a kind of ministerial word for somebody else in my congregation or in my life. Because regularly, I'll hear a word from God early in the morning that was for Cindy at my 2 o'clock appointment. But here's the other piece. Time alone with God every day creates the only thing I can call it, and I typed it this way, space for innovation in my ministry. If I'm not abiding in Jesus, if I'm not remaining in him, if I'm not keeping myself full of gas so that I don't run out in the last half a lap, innovation in my life goes down. 
Innovation in our ministry goes down. It takes all of us together, staying connected and learning to abide in Christ for innovation to stay high in our places of ministry. I'm amazed as I look back over the landscape of now almost 18 years of ministry in the same place, how often a word of innovation that if I had missed it, hundreds if not thousands of people wouldn't know Jesus today. I think about the day I was writing after I had just spent some time with Jesus in my house on a Friday. I was writing out to do an Emmaus talk. And as I'm passing by the Olga Fort Myers Shores United Methodist Church, the Holy Spirit whispered and said, I want to do something there. And I went to my district superintendent and I said, Sharon, I know you might think this is crazy. I, I find it, by the way, interesting that you have to apologize for saying you hear from God. Th that's how bad it's gotten in many of our United Methodist cultures. That if, you, if, you, if you're naive enough to say the Lord spoke to me, they might, um, get the paddy wagon, boy's lost his marbles. But, you know, I, I think God ought to speak to us, right? amen? And so, so I'm driving down the road and the Lord says, I want to do something there. And I went to my superintendent and I said, Sharon, I think God wants us to do something there. And here's the beautiful thing, Bishop, is that Sharon says back to me, you know, I was praying about that this morning. And the Lord said to me to talk to you today at lunch about doing something out at that campus. And we closed that church. It was dying. It was deadly. It was full of mean rattlesnake folks. And we closed that church. And today, you know, hundreds of people know Jesus. And, and it's a light in that neighborhood. And, and it, it, what, if, what if I wasn't abiding? What if I had run out of gas just before I got to? And how much innovation is left on the ground because we're not abiding in him? So here, here's, here's the next one I want to share with you. The third thing I want to say, and again, there's a lot in this text, but let me just share this third one. Uh, this is the last one. Faithfulness requires pruning. Now, do you remember up in verse 2, um, Jesus says that Jesus says that the father, the Georgios in the Greek, the gardener, the tender, he's the one who cuts off every branch. But then there's this little phrase in there that Bruce Wilkerson helped us in the book, Secrets of the Vine. He, he said, you know, we tend to think that that's kind of cruel, you know, this cutting off and all this stuff. And he says, he says it's interesting that Jesus calls them these branches of mine. These are the branches of Jesus. He says, these are my beloved. And here's the deal. Um, the Bible teaches over and over and over again that God disciplines those whom he loves. And so this pruning and this purifying ought not to scare us as followers of Jesus. And Bruce Wilkerson was the one who taught me that, 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 that these new vine branches have a tendency to grow along the ground. And so they get dusty and when it rains they get mustied and mildewed. And then the branches become sick and useless and fruitless. And are they cut off? No. You see, the branch is too valuable for that. The vine dresser goes through the vineyard with a bucket of water looking for these little sick branches. And he lifts them up and he washes them and he ties them up. And the branch then becomes thriving and fruitful. And I believe this is what God does to us in discipline. You see, sin covers our life. I don't know about you, but I still wrestle with sin every hour, every day. It seems like every minute. Sin covers my life and your life, and, 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 and God wants to get a hold of our low-lying ways. Pretty soon, because we live too close to the ground, we're sick and we're dying, and we are fruitless. And the tender God that we love reaches down, and he lifts us up, and he cleanses us, and this cleansing is his divine discipline. You see, divine discipline, stay with me on this church, is evidence of divine love. You see, God cultivates Christ's followers so that we can be more fruitful. Just like a diligent parent disciplines their child out of love because they want them to grow up right. Our Father in heaven disciplines us so that we'll grow to become more fully devoted, fruit-bearing disciples of Jesus. Pastor West, would you make your way up here? During my sabbatical, I took four months off. 
was privileged because I, I was awarded a Lilly grant, and so it funded uh, a once-in-a-lifetime four months. And the first month, I called my detox month because, you know, after like 28 years of on all the time, I don't know what it's like to be off. And, and uh, 